morning, good morning. We are in a series. We're about to complete a, a three-month series on the book of James, as you saw there in that bumper video, uh, Letters from a Skeptic, a letter from a skeptic. And it's fascinating, the letter of James in the New Testament is, is the fact that James was at one time a huge skeptic of his brother Jesus, and then the resurrection changed all that, which we'll be celebrating in two weeks on Easter Sunday. But this one-time skeptic wrote a letter to Christians spread throughout the region within he, which he was writing. And uh, the result are these five chapters we've been looking at. So if today's your first day, we're glad you're with us. You can go back on our YouTube channel, watch the previous ones. And today, I'm guaranteeing you today, you need this message, okay? I'm guaranteeing you today because today we're going to talk about patience. And if today you're here and you're way too relaxed and you need your blood pressure to go up, like your life is way too easy right now, I thought about this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to show you something that is guaranteed to increase your blood pressure. Ready? Look at this on the screen. Ready? That right there. The death spiral on your computer where you're just having to wait. Let's just look at that and just feel the tension in our bodies go up, right? Because that can happen for a couple of seconds and you feel like this is taking so long, correct? Any of you see Wednesday, the front page of the Dayton Daily News had a headline that construction on I-75 is going to begin soon, a two-year project <laughs> to just basically annihilate those of you who have to drive into Dayton every day, your trip. And I was amazed by when I read that, I don't even drive on I-75 during the week, and my brain started immediately going to plans on how I'm going to go around that. Because if you're like me, I was talking with my friend John Hitchens. He was an F-15 fighter pilot. So his patience is not his virtue. And we were talking about the fact of how we would rather go up 675 to, to 70 and around knowing we're making progress, even though it may take longer, because we just don't want to sit another time at I-75 during constructions. In that same issue of the Dayton Daily News, later on, there was an article, this is the season of yellow lilies and orange barrels. <laughs> and it's, it's just blossoming all, blossoming all around us. We, we are an impatient people. I can't watch something live anymore. Have any of you been afflicted with this malady of, if I have so perfected being able to watch a football game in a half an hour, I tape it and then boom, 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 plus 30. And I can literally watch a football game in a half an hour. I can't watch them live now. I don't enjoy it. Too many commercials. Have you seen just, I just noticed I think the rate of honking has increased in our culture. We're more like Manhattan than we used to be. Have you noticed this? Richard Levine is an author, and he said there ought to be a new measurement of time called the honko second. And the honko second is the time between when the light turns green and the person behind you starts honking their horn. The, 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 the shortest measurement of time in science, he says, would be the honko second. And uh, this is serious, friends, because it, it does have major, major spiritual implications, our impatient society. Now, wonder James, when we get to chapter 5, he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the light turns green. And that's not what it says, until the Lord's coming. In other words, we're in this for the long haul. And as you know, there are a lot more serious implications on waiting than just waiting for green lights and waiting for, uh, you know, the spinny thing to stop spinning on your laptop. There are some serious, serious implications when it comes to waiting on the Lord. Let's do a little test and see how impatient you are at a stoplight. The driver of the car in front of you is having an extended and distracting conversation on his phone. So you're in the back of this now. What do you do? Are you happy he is not experiencing the stoplight alone? fantasize of things you would like to say to the driver. Yep, yep, there you go. Or attempt to drive around or over the other guy's car. Here's the other one. You've been sitting in the waiting room of your doctor's office for an hour. You are, A, grateful for the chance to catch up on the 2003 Reader's <laughs> Digest. 
B, tell the other patients you have a highly contagious and fatal disease, hoping it'll empty the waiting room. You've thought of it. I know you have. Or C, force yourself to hyperventilate to get immediate attention. I told a while back I was in a major car accident about 10 years ago, about 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. And I told the emergency, I was taken by a squad to the emergency room in Miami Valley South. And I told them, I said, in however many years, 30, 27 years of ministry, I've never missed a preaching assignment. You got to get me out of here so that I can get to church tonight at five o'clock. And they did. I was out of the emergency room in a half an hour. And I'd like to say it was because of the nobility of preaching. It was, I'm going to pull the preacher card so I don't have to wait in the, the waiting room for hours. That's what I'm going to do. We, we know this is a huge issue because everything in life that matters requires waiting, doesn't it? Everything, including our relationship with God. Lou Smead said this, he said, waiting is our destiny as creatures who cannot by themselves bring about what they hope for. We wait in fear for a happy ending we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. Waiting is the hardest work of hope. I think of all the topics that James covers, this is one that we can take lightly that commensurate to that. It may be as serious as any topic he covers, especially for 21st century American Christians. Because we're being conditioned to not have to wait. And yet, it is essential that we build into our psyches, our souls, this patient capacity. Think about this. Think about how many times, I didn't think about this till this week, how many times you've been at a wedding and you've heard 1 Corinthians 13 quoted. Does anybody remember how 1 Corinthians 13, 4 begins in, in the definition of love? The very first thing Paul says is love is patient. You cannot love well and be an impatient person. And I don't know how seriously you take this. There's no topic that I've taught on through this series where it is more physician, heal thyself. Because I'm not a patient person. And the more demanding life gets, the less patient I tend to get. And I want to speak to those of you who are right now, you're a cancer patient and you're waiting for the chemo to take effect. And today is for you. If you're in between jobs and you're waiting for that call to come that you got the job you were hoping for. If you're lonely and you're waiting to be picked either on the playground if, you're, if there's a child or as an adult and you, you've not been chosen yet. If you're waiting for the Lord to either heal your parent in the nursing home or take her home, we could go on and on about the topics related to waiting that are of a serious nature. Do you know that 43 times in the Old Testament, God tells the people of Israel, wait. 43 times. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently him for him. Did you catch that? I'm, that song, I'm standing, I'm sitting still, Lord. We're going to practice that toward the end. Who was it that said all of humanity's problems stem from his inability to sit alone in his room? In other words, impatience causes us to do so many rash things. Or what about Psalm 37, 34? Wait for the Lord and keep to his way and he will exalt you to inherit the land. Wait for the Lord. Now, it's really interesting that the Old Testament word for wait, did you know what the Old Testament word for wait is? It's the same word used of a rope. Now, this is really important to catch. A rope of three strands. So we often think of waiting as I'm sitting on... 48, and I'm waiting for the people in front of me. And it's a passive activity. The Hebrew understanding of waiting was an active activity, that while I'm waiting, that's an opportunity to, in the words, in the pic, word picture of a rope, to wrap myself around God, to be interactive with the Lord. And that changes the pauses in your life that you don't want. 
when you look at it this way. You see, when what God does in us while we wait is as important as what it is we are waiting for. At the very minimum. You cannot have faith without the ability to wait. You can't. Inherent is the gap between what we hope for and the fulfillment of that hope, and that requires patience. Daniel Goleman famously talked about this in his book, Emotional Intelligence, years ago. He wrote the book and said, we're seeing now success is not about intellectual intelligence. It's about emotional intelligence. It's not about IQ. It's about EQ. And at the core of that, he said, of emotional intelligence is the ability to wait. And so he was the one who introduced the marshmallow test of the fourth graders who were given one marshmallow and said, if you'll wait, when I come back from my errand, you'll be given two marshmallows. And then Stanford University in their study tracked those who were not able to wait for the second marshmallow and those who were able to wait for the second marshmallow and those who were not able to wait grew up to be the most frustrated of adults. And those who were able to wait on the second marshmallow grew up to be leaders, self-controlled, etc. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I go, man, I know I would have been the kid going after the one marshmallow. I just know it. I just know it. And yet we, we can change. And that's why Daniel Goleman said, the ability to wait is the master aptitude. The ability to wait is the master aptitude. You know where the Proverbs puts that? Proverbs puts that, that he who controls his spirit is greater than the one who controls a city. Isn't that interesting? That if you can master your emotions and you can learn to be active with the gaps in your life and strategic, you've conquered the most difficult of entities to conquer, and that is your spirit. Here's the way I put this today. Here's the phrase that pays today is over and over again, we see this in life. If you can wait, you can win. If you can wait, you can win. That the rewards of life go to the person who waits. One of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 24 that says, the sluggard does not plow in season, so at harvest he looks and finds nothing. In other words, people who want immediate gratification, immediate satisfaction. Well, you know, I worked out yesterday. Why am I not getting the results tomorrow? They never, they never do the workout. They never do the studying. They never do the work behind the scenes. Why? Because they want immediate feedback. And the implication of that proverb is, is the person who's willing to do the work and then wait for the results is the one who's going to be rewarded in life. You see, waiting on God is a confident, disciplined, expectant, active, and sometimes painful clinging to God. This will change your waiting gaps if you see it this way. This will change how you sit at the light. This will change how you shop and stand in the long line. This will change how you engage in conversations. And like I said, I don't know about you, but I need it. So let's look at what James says. The first thing James says is, he says, I want you to be sure that you're waiting on God's processes to be finished. Built into nature is this process of spring, you plant, and then when do you reap? When do you reap? In the fall. And so look what he says. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient. And the word there is hupomene, which means to bear up under. You just bear up under that. Stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, which is a sign of impatience, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged. The judge is standing at the door. So just look at nature, James says, and know that you plant in the spring, you don't reap in the spring. You gotta wait. It's built into nature, the value of waiting. Uh, have you ever read anything about Nelson Mandela? It's the most impressive story of waiting. 27 years in prison, unjustly in prison. 27 years under apartheid. And finally, the justice of his cause came to light. 27 years. You know, there's, an, there's a thing we use in player's box where we teach the students the Asian bamboo tree is planted in the ground and then it's watered and fertilized for, for a year. 
two years, three years, four years, five years, nothing happens. Five years of watered, fertilized, nothing happens. But in the fifth year, the, the, the bamboo tree in a six-week period will grow roughly 90 feet. And what's the point of that analogy? I think God builds those realities into this world in a natural way to show us spiritual lessons that when, when, did, it, when did it grow that 90 feet? Was it over six weeks or was it over five years? And the answer is over five years. If there wasn't that watering and staying with the task, staying with the task, being patient, there wouldn't be the growth in, of 90 feet in six weeks. And I don't know where you are today. I, I, think, I think a lot of sexual mistakes are made because of this. And those are the big ones that, redu that reduce our lives to, to deep shame. Because in this culture, we're told you don't have to wait on sex. And a lot of wounding happens because we just can't wait. We can't cultivate healthy relationships within God's will. James 6, or Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. For those of you right now that you have your walk with God that you've initiated this year and you're waiting for God to show up, start answering your prayers the way you want them to be answered. Start showing up with evidences of his presence in your life. Can you wait? Because the principle we see over and over again is you plant in the spring, but you don't reap in the spring. And the farmer knows that there are outcomes outside of his or her control. And they have to wait. If you can wait, you can win. You will not be beaten if you learn to wait on the Lord. Second truth that James says is wait on God's promises to be fulfilled. He says in verse 10, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who persevered. So he goes back and he says, look at the Old Testament. Look at people like Noah who said it's going to flood and people mocked him for years. Or Moses who said there's, there's a plague coming, Pharaoh, and he was mocked for that. You look at people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, who predicted a Messiah is going to come who's going to deliver the world. And they were mocked for their faith, which inherent to that faith was waiting on God's promise to be fulfilled. Probably the great example of this is Abraham. Abraham, 75 years of age. He and Sarah are childless, which is one of the most excruciating periods of waiting to go through in, in my experience with people. And God says, Abraham, you're going to bear children and, and your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore. He's 75. I mean, he's not buying green bananas at this point in his life. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and get, here's what people forget. It's 24 years later that was fulfilled. The Hebrew writer tells us that Abraham longed for a city he never saw on this earth. He never saw it. He was, he was projecting a vision of a city of God that wasn't in existence before he passed from this life. And over and over again, we see people, James says, the prophets who we see the Bible in its highlights. You know, we see the Bible with all these condensed events. Even Jesus' life, we think that there was just one thing after another of these miraculous fulfillments. Well, in reality, it wasn't as compressed as we often read it. And they had to wait. Peter said this, he said, don't forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Isn't that a most frustrating verse in the Bible right there? <laughs> the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. God very seldom acts on our timetable. John Ortberg said we are a double espresso follower, usually dealing with a decaf God who's just not working on our timetable. Every time I read that verse, I think about the guy who came to God and he said, he said, Lord, is it true that with you a thousand years is like a day? Yeah. Is it true with you a thousand years is like a second? Yeah, it is. Is it true that with you a million dollars is like a penny? Yeah, it is. 
Lord, can I have a million dollars? Sure. Just a second. <laughs> so we always want it to be our timetable, don't we? And we think, if we don't get it right now, if the wheel doesn't stop spinning, I can't wait. But inherent to faith is waiting. James says, wait on God's purposes to be revealed. This is the most famous story that he's about to tell us and remind us of, of patience in the Bible. When I say blanks patience, who do you think of? Job. The famous story of Job. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The New English translation translates that. You've heard of Job's patience and have seen the Lord's promise, or purpose, I should say, that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Now look at that. Look at that. Look at that. God never tells Job why. Do you know that? He never tells him why. If you don't know the story of Job, Job was worth what in our currency was $10 million. I mean, he was wealthy. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 uh, camels. He had 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. And in just a matter of hours, all of that wealth was taken. His, his health was taken. He had 10 children. They were all taken from him in a major tornado. And is all gone. A symbol of how this life can be wiped out in a second. And God never tells him why, but what he learns if you read in Job's narrative, you read a picture of the Hebrew word for waiting, which means wrap yourself around God. Because what does he do? He, he wraps himself around God by asking questions, by having doubt. Those of you who've been raised to believe you should never doubt God. You should never ask questions. Oh, you could just go to the book of Job. Job is just asking questions. Why God? Why God? Why God? Why God? And he has some friends with him who aren't really helping very much either. And, and why God? Why God? And he wraps himself around the Lord. And God never says why, but he does bless him. At the end of Job's narrative, we see that God blesses him. He had 7,000 sheep. God gives him 14,000. He has uh, 3,000 camels. God blesses him with 6,000 camels. He had 500 yoke of oxen. God blessed him with 1,000 yoke of oxen. He has uh, 500 donkeys. God blesses him with 1,000 donkeys. He had 10 children. God gave him 10 children back. Why didn't he give him 20? Because God was blessing him. <laughs> he knew this that would not be a blessing, give him 20 children. But what that is, whether it's literal or not, the truth is literal, that God is active in our waiting if we want him to be. And his purposes are revealed, and that purpose is this, that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. What God does in you when you're waiting is show himself, which is the whole point of life. Everything that happens to you in life is, is so that you might grow in trust in this relationship with your creator and your heavenly father. Everything, everything that happens is through the filter of if you will trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your paths. You'll begin to see he's there, he's active. He is not sitting back like a Buddha passively watching me suffer. He is involved. And at the end of Job, at the beginning of Job, Job 13, 15, Job says, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the ultimate statement of faith. To when you get to chapter 23, he says, when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And I love that because that is the statement of the person who's learning to wait. I'm being refined. I'm being tested so that I might come forth as gold. And what's really interesting is all the Old Testament points toward a Messiah is coming, a Messiah is coming. And you would think that when you get to the New Testament, it's all done, no more waiting. And yet, when we get to the New Testament, we still see God active in this way. Look at a few of these verses from, for example, Luke chapter two. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
Jesus had come, and yet he's still waiting for it to be evidence. And see, this is our life, isn't it? That, that, that the Lord has come, and we are waiting for him to come. The kingdom has come, and we are waiting for it to come some more, aren't we? That's, that's what it means to live in the kingdom of Christ, is you have, and you don't have yet. That's, that's the reality. We think that once I become a Christian, it ought to be, I have, I have, I have, I get everything I want. And it's not that way. Jesus said to his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised. Wait for the gift. Paul says in Romans 8, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies, that the groaning of the not yetness of this life, we have, we have these promises, we have a down payment of heaven in Christ, but not yet. He says we groan. Do, am I speaking to any groaners? Yeah. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. If you can wait, you can win, Paul says. And the very last verse of the Bible almost is, he who testifies these things says, I'm coming soon, amen, come Lord Jesus. Think about that. The, almost the last verse of the Bible is, wait, he's coming. He's coming for you. Now, as I said, if you can wait, you can win. And if you can wait in the little things, you'll wait in the big things. But if you can't wait in the little things, then you're going to have trouble waiting in the big things. That's why if you leave here today going, I'm going to start trying harder to wait. I'm going to try harder. You activate a system that actually is going against your being patient. You're activating an aggressiveness in your, in your body that actually prohibits waiting. It, you're activating a, an, autonomic, an autonomic system in your body that says, don't wait, don't wait, by saying, wait, wait, wait. And so we have to learn how to train. So I want to give a shortcut because I am, my family will tell you, those of us who are impatient, I, there's something I'm the best in the world at, finding shortcuts. I'm the best in the world at frustrating my family by finding shortcuts that don't always work out. But I want you to notice something here. Look at this. Look at this. James is talking about waiting. And then look what he says. Look what he says. He goes, then, above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. And when you look at that, you go, what does that have to do with patience? What does that have to do with waiting? Did he say, like, you know, I just want to include this one more thing in here. And it's going to put this in the letter. And it was inserted. Now, this is the shortcut. It's hinted at here. What he's talking about that Jesus talked about in Matthew 6, he repeated a lot of his brother's teachings, and Jesus taught this in the Sermon on the Mount, was oath-taking and oath-swearing was a way to verbally manipulate people. Hand to God, hand to God, you can trust me, hand to God. And it was a way of getting your way. Manipulate using words. Those of you who are in sales positions, know how easy it is, easiest to use words to manipulate people. And you can go over the line, right? And we preachers know this all too well. It's easy to, to use words in such a way that you get your way when you want your way. And this is utterly connected to the impatient spirit because James says here, he says, I want you to lay down the need to get your way. That's, that's what he's saying here. I want you to lay that down. And so I want you to hear that, Southbrook. And I want you to use that as your shortcut to training yourself to be patient. And that is, I'm going to be intentional in the little things of life to not always get my way when I want my way. And if you can do that, you'll find yourself loving better. Because to love well is to be patient. So here are three training areas that literally when you get in our parking lot today, you can start using this as a training tool, okay? 
So here are three ways that you intentionally this week, you say, I'm going to use these three little things in life to train myself. Conversation. I take the longer listen without having to interrupt because I've got a better thought percolating in my head than they're expressing to me right now. And I don't know about you, but I am terrible at interrupting people. Why? Because what I'm saying is so important, it needs to be heard in this conversation. And James is saying, let that go. Let that go. You may be in a conversation that is boring and laborious. You say to yourself, I'm waiting on the Lord to end this conversation right now. I'm wait, I am wrapping myself around God and I'm engaging because you're doing that. You're literally creating new neural connections in your brain that say, be patient. What about this one? Driving. You take the lagger lane intentionally. When you don't, I see some of you going, ain't no way, ain't no way I'm doing this. Ain't no way. Now you've gone to meddling. The, the lagger lane is when you don't have to be somewhere you intentionally get in the right lane and you intentionally set yourself to the speed limit. And I know some of you, this is like, you're, you're saying, I know, you're saying, I mean, that, I, like I, I got a better chance of turning water into wine. I really do than to do that. But you'd be amazed at how not having to get your way, get to where you want to get, when you want to get there because you're training yourself to just wait, to be patient. Well, what about this one? In shopping, you take the longer line. You don't have to be somewhere. Your time now, you realize that all impatience is about ego. That's really what it's about. My time is so important that I got to get what I want when I need to get it. James says, no, you, you stop that. You stop getting what you want when you want it. And you take the longer line just to take the longer line. And why? It's because impatience is an act of the ego that's been trained to be impatient. That's what it is. That's what it is. And the more you're impatient, so you're driving in traffic and you just say, oh, I can't take this anymore. Boom, I'm going around. Even though you really don't have to be anywhere. You really don't. You're saying to your brain, be impatient, be impatient, be impatient. And it'll be harder to be patient when you need to be patient. But no, no, not you, Southbrooker. You are so blessed to hear the truth. You're going to take the longer listen. You're going to take the lagger line and you're going to take the longer li lagger lane. You're going to take the longer line. And when you do that, you'll start seeing this principle come into play that if you can wait, you can win. He who controls his spirit is greater than he who controls a city. Amen? Amen. So, you don't have to wait anymore for this sermon to be done. I'm done. <laughs> okay? What we're going to do is, is we know this. Here's what we know. We know that Charlie Dunn speaking leads to prayer. We're done. Let my people go. You know, it's like, let my people go. That's our liturgy. We have this liturgy. So your brain right now is cueing, get up and get out of here. But we want you to sit and we want you to listen. We want you to literally practice waiting for just a few minutes. Taylor and Carolina are going to be, sing a song about waiting on the Lord. And so for the next few minutes, as you hear them sing this song, you, you literally can begin practicing in just the little things of life. I'm going to teach my soul and my spirit. I'm going to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Because if I can't wait in the little things, I won't wait in the big things either. And you can't wait. You can't trust. You can't have faith. It's essential. So listen and wait as Taylor and Carolina lead us. Let's pray. If we can't wait, we can't love well. And so today, your challenge to us through this amazing letter is to be the kind of people who start with you and learn to wait on you, learn to wait with you, wrap ourselves around you when we are waiting. And we know, Father, that there are some serious situations right now where people are waiting on, on so many important things that to do with health and family. And we pray that today you speak 
as we sit here right now, you speak and you whisper, I'm here, I'm working. Wait, and you'll see my work come to evidence. And so may we be increasingly a people who wait on the Lord. And we're not always in a hurry to get our own way when we want to get it. We follow the one who said, not my will, but your will be done. And so now as we practice the symbols of Christ's body and blood, Lord, we do so knowing that most of life is at least the the third day type reality, that we wait on the third day that is the Lord's day. Thank you. We look forward to next week as we talk about prayer, maybe our most important subject matter, and we pray you prepare us this week. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. See you next week.